is Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and that can be found on page 546 in the Pew Bibles. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when people rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint. When people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred. Then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Heather. It was well read, especially that last phrase. Let's pray. Father, uh, turn our minds and our hearts fully on to your word now. Help us to understand, to apply, and to treasure the truth in your word. And help us to reckon with the reality of death in a way that honors Jesus. In his name, amen. So just to get you up to speed, we're taking um, some time off from our series in worship. We're coming back to it in a few weeks when I'm back from China. Um, and we're going to spend some time together in the Psalms this summer. Back in March, I was with this group of pastors, the Akenge Fellows Program in Boston. And our topic for that particular meeting was um, health care and technology. And we visited the head chaplain at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. We got to talk to a leading researcher in, in um, heart disease and medication. We had some fascinating interactions and discussions, but there was one thing that was said during that, those two days that has stuck with me the most. Uh, it was my friend Jason McConnell, who was a pastor in Franklin, Vermont. And he said... Our job as pastors is to prepare people for death. Our job as pastors is to prepare people for death. And at first I thought, what? That can't be all that it's about, really? But the more I thought about it, I think he's right. Because death is coming for each one of us. There are no exceptions. Nobody gets a pass. You don't get a pass for being a Christian. You don't get a pass for living a healthy lifestyle. You don't get a pass for being young. Death is coming. You know, one out of every one people, I've heard it said, <laughs> dies. And so this is a reality that each person has to face on many different levels. And my job as your pastor is in one way or another to help prepare you for that reality. So in this sermon, I want to ask, how? How can we, as followers of Jesus, prepare for death, prepare for the end of our life? Now, first and foremost, we need to prepare spiritually. The, the thing that we need the most is to be reconciled to God, the God who made us, so that, so that rather than receiving his judgment, we receive his forgiveness and salvation from our sin through Christ. 
But that's not what I'm going to talk about primarily this morning because we spend a lot of time as Christians talking about what happens right after death, heaven and hell and judgment. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about what comes right before death, right up to death. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, how being a Christian should change the way we approach death. The end of life. Now, some of you in this room are getting advanced in years or maybe battling a serious health issue, and so this is something you think about a lot. Some of you are taking care of aging parents or siblings or spouses, and you think about this a lot. Some of you are young and healthy, and now is the time to think about this. So this this sermon is for everybody here. And what I want to do is offer you three pieces of biblical wisdom for how to approach death with Jesus. The first is to be honest about the end. The second is to be prepared for the end. The third is to be faithful to the end. Be honest about the end, to be prepared for the end, and be faithful to the end. So first, be honest. Our, our American culture is extremely dishonest about death. If you don't believe me, just turn on the TV. You'll see ads for retirement communities where people are just taking painting classes and, and, and dance classes and having the time of their lives in a place that looks like paradise. Not talking about the fact that you go there because you're getting closer to the end of your life. You'll see ads for medication with these silver-haired men who look like they just ran a triathlon. And if you take this pill for arthritis, you can be just as fit and healthy as this dude, right? You see see ads for anti-aging creams. How can a cream stop your aging? (laughs) We like to pretend that death is not coming. That if we just live healthy and, you know, we all have stories of that 90-year-old person who still does yoga every day and, and, and is in great shape, that's the exception. And death's coming for that person too. I was listening to a pastor named Scott Sauls preach a sermon, and um, he told a funny story about getting his first AARP subscription offer in the mail when he turned 50, I think, 55. 50. And for him, the arrival of this magazine was like, was like a bad omen, you know? This means I'm getting up there. But the subscription offer said, to his amazement, subscribe now and receive a free sporty tote bag. And he said, I don't want a sporty tote bag. I want to live forever. <laughs> a sporty tote bag is not going to solve my problems right now. But we live in a culture that thinks death is a problem we can solve. It's not. We we stay positive and pretend that it's not a reality. And ironically, our health care system has contributed to this mindset, this problem. I learned this by reading a book as part of this program um, called Being Mortal. It's by a physician, by a surgeon actually, named Atul Gawande. He's an Indian-American man. He's a surgeon at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And as someone who represents a pillar of the American healthcare system and the best it has to offer, he says that, that when it comes to facing the reality of death, our healthcare system has failed to do that, failed to help people cope with death. Why is that? It's because the medical system is built on the principle of solving problems. So, so we can send your cancer into remission, we can give you a new knee, we can give you medication to control your blood pressure, we can even give you a heart transplant if you need it. But Death is not a problem we can solve. You know, solving problems is a good thing. Some of you in this room 
are only here because you've had a life-saving medical intervention that was not possible when your parents were your age. Right? Medical technology and progress is a gift from God. And yet, death is not a problem that we can solve with medicine or surgery or therapy. And, and our medical system doesn't know what to do with that. So people... People seek treatments um, and do things well past the point of when they're not helping anymore and think that there's got to be a way to just get better and sometimes there's not. Uh, if your body, think of your body like a machine and, and doctors can replace parts and, and, and do some maintenance, but at some point the machine is going to break down. I'm not sure if you caught this, but the passage in Ecclesiastes we read um, describes this inevitable breakdown of the human body. It starts saying, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come. What are the days of trouble? It's talking about old age, when life is harder, when it's not as fun, when your body breaks down. And he just goes on to describe this process of the body breaking down, kind of like a, a household gradually falling apart and falling into disrepair. And if you use your imagination, you can picture this so well. Uh, I'm going to go through a few of these images. Verse 3, When the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop. What's he talking about there? When your legs begin to tremble and your shoulders stoop over. When the grinders cease because they are few. Any ideas what he's saying there? When your teeth fall out. Right. Spoken from someone with experience, right? Yeah. People would grind grain with a, a mortar and a pestle, but well, like teeth. When those looking through the windows grow dim, eye failing eyesight, right? When the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades. You know, as, as people's senses diminish, they feel closed off to the world. They can't interact with people the same way. There's a sense of isolation. This is a good one. Verse, uh, well, same verse, verse 4. When people rise up at the sound of birds. You ever, ever have trouble sleeping? And then the, the slightest noise in the morning wakes you up and you can't get back to sleep. Verse 5, when people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets. Seeing some nods here. When it becomes like a challenge to even get out to the grocery store because you're afraid you'll slip and fall, right? You're afraid of simple things. When... Uh, the almond tree blossoms. I'll give you a hint. The almond tree blossom is white. I'm seeing some almond tree blossom colored hair out here. <laughs> yeah. And some of you put dye in to hide the almond blossom color. <laughs> and the grasshopper drags itself along. Have you ever seen a hurt grasshopper kind of Limping along, can you picture someone walking with a walker and sort of an uneven gait? Such vivid imagery, isn't it? Finally, and desire is no longer stirred. He's talking about that kind of desire, just so you know. <laughs> it's in the Bible, you know. I'm hearing laughter that you guys can relate to these things, <laughs> right? Right? And if you can't relate to them now, you probably will someday. I feel honestly, <laughs> I feel a little unqualified to be one of the youngest adults in the room preaching this sermon, but it'll get there for me someday too. Old age is a series of things falling apart and breaking down. And that's not fun, is it? I used to work in an adult daycare center in Middlebury where um, I, I would spoon feed a woman with advanced dementia 
I would change diapers and give people showers. I would um, escort wobbly men and women from one chair to another. And there was one man who would tell me the same thing every day, probably because he couldn't remember he had told me the day before, but he would look at me and say, and say, don't get old. It's no fun. Don't get old. It's no fun. That's exactly what, what Ecclesiastes 12 is saying. That old age is no fun. Things break down. And, and probably the worst part is that old age is the precursor to what comes next, which is death. That's what uh, he says in the next verses. Verse 6, remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken. He pictures life like this precious thing, this precious golden bowl hanging from a silver cord, but, but when that cord is cut, the bowl falls and shatters, and it's the end. When the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well, you know, water, the sign of life, Water runs out of a broken pitcher, never to be, uh, to be recovered. And finally, he says it plainly in verse 7, the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Genesis 3, from dust you are and to dust you shall return. We have to take a hard, long look at our mortality. It's not being morbid, it's just being honest. But even though the culture wants to, wants to pretend it's not there and to deny it, Christians need to be real about it. We need to take a hard look at our mortality. It's simply wisdom to do that. How can we do that? Well, I would suggest praying what David did in Psalm 39. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. Take walks in a cemetery. Go to funerals. Take your kids to funerals. Uh, talk about death with the people you love in an honest way. Not in a, in a euphemistic or a, um, a way that avoids the real subject. We have to be honest. But secondly, we need to be prepared for the end. Once we're honest about it, we can do some things to prepare for it. Some things that, um, that are very beneficial. And part of this is to think realistically about what the end is actually like. Dr. Gawande explains in his book that in, in years past, in generations past, Life would be going along fine and then suddenly something would happen. You'd get an infection or have a heart attack and your life would stop. That was the end. Recently though, modern medicine has made, made it into a long tail, a long progression, a long slide downward, which means many of us, statistically, We'll probably spend time in the hospital faced with hard decisions about what treatments we should get. Whether to get this potentially life-saving or, or, or helpful intervention or not. What the costs, cost and benefits are. It also means that some, many of us will spend a significant amount of our life unable to live independently. We'll need to move out of our homes, or have assistance with daily tasks. Dr. Gawande says, We do not like to think about this eventuality. As a result, most of us are unprepared for it. We rarely pay more than glancing attention to how we will live when we need help until it's too late to do much about it. So, with the wisdom from God that we can have, we need to not wait until it's too late. We need to, uh, you know, don't wait until you can no longer stay in your home to figure out what you're going to do when you can no longer stay in your home. Don't make your children or your caregivers decide that. Don't wait until you're in the ICU 
to let your kids or spouse know what kind of treatments you want at the end of your life. Talk about it now when you have a clear mind, when you can think through things and pray through things. Don't wait until you're on your deathbed to, to pass on wisdom you have for people and, and to think about your own uh, funeral and how you want to be remembered. In fact, I have some homework for you today. In the back, there's a green piece of paper. And if you're a, a member, a regular attender of this church, I am assigning this to you to take home and to fill out. It's things like, what scriptures would you like read or preached at your funeral? How would you like to be buried? Uh, what songs are important to you to have sung at your funeral? It's just, it's good, it's wise to be prepared and to not leave it um, to a hard time when the days of trouble come. It's never too early to prepare. Um, and I think, I think the way to prepare for the end is to have those hard conversations with the people you love. When you do that, it's actually an act of love for those people. And it's also an act of courage uh, that you're going to need to trust God for. I believe it, it honors God. It honors the Lord Jesus to be prepared for the end of your life. You don't know when it will happen or how it will happen, but you can do your best to be prepared. Finally, though, be faithful to the end. Be faithful to the end. There's one command at the beginning of Ecclesiastes 12 which gives the key to approaching death well. It starts off by saying, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Remember your Creator, which is to say, put God first, honor Him, and for us, follow Jesus now so that at the end you can follow Him when it gets hard. It's never too early to start, never too late, rather, to start doing this, or too early for that matter. And uh, I want to talk a f about a few ways we can do this. Um, you know, age is a series of cruel losses, as Ecclesiastes 12 says. And one thing after another that makes life feel like it's worth living is taken away. Independence, pleasure, uh, enjoyment of things you used to like. We, we've um, seen this happen in our own church in many ways. Barry has, Haybecker has had to give up a lot of things he loves, including trout fishing, doesn't drive much anymore. Uh, uh, Barbara Niquette had to give up playing piano that she's played for 80 years, 75, 80 years because of her eyesight. These are tough losses. Valerie Bell can't come to church because of health issues. And it may seem, when this happens, it may seem like um, life is not worth living. Or we wonder, what does God have for me in, my, in this time of, uh, of inability? Does God still have a purpose for me? And the answer is yes. God still has a purpose for you, even when those days of trouble come. And I believe there are actually a few things that you can only do to honor God in those days of trouble. Things that you can uniquely do to follow Jesus. Let me, let me mention three. The first is that you have the opportunity to reconcile with people. You have the opportunity to reconcile with people. When our group met with the head chaplain at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, uh, one of the members of our group asked him, um, have you seen any like common regrets that people have at the end of their lives? This is a man who sat with literally thousands of dying people in his 30-year career. And he paused for a moment and then he said, the number one regret is people saying they wish they had reconciled sooner with people they love. So, so Reconcile with people. 
Whatever you need to say, whether it's I'm sorry or I forgive you or just I love you, reconcile. And I would add to that, if you have just a a parting word for somebody, people really pay attention at when you're at the end of your life, you can say things that will stick with people for the rest of their lives. Just a few months ago, my grandfather passed away. Many of you know. And I could tell as he, in those last few times I saw him, that he was getting serious and wanted people to know that he loved them. And he said, Tyler, I'm proud of you. And those are, those are words that stick with you, you know. And, and you have a power to do that when these days of trouble come. You have a special gift of that time to be able to say those words. Well, secondly and related, <clears throat> you have wisdom to pass on. As you approach the end of your life, you enter into kind of a, a wisdom, a time of wisdom when people will listen to you and, and look to you for what you've learned over your, the course of your life. So you have a perspective and wisdom to offer and don't, don't just close in and, and, and shut down, but, but actually think about what you want to pass on to the next generation, to your kids, to your grandkids, to your church family. You have wisdom to offer. Finally, number three, you have an opportunity to grow. Yeah, to grow, actually, spiritually, in new ways. Maybe instead of simply seeing this list of things in Ecclesiastes 12 as, as evils, you can see them as opportunities to press in, to trust in God more. What if every achy joint and every forgetful moment and every time you feel pain in your body or mind, you could say, uh, you could draw near to the God who says, my power is made perfect in weakness. And in that sense, aging is probably the most fertile soil for your own spiritual growth as you have to trust God more, have to lean in to those promises. You have an opportunity to grow spiritually. So be honest about the end. Be prepared for the end. And be faithful to the end. I believe that if you are a follower of Jesus, you can do all those things for one reason. And that was a reason, this is a reason that the writer of Ecclesiastes did not see fully. But that we have a Lord, we have a Savior who died so that we can die uh, faithfully. But then he also came through the other side of death, didn't he? He went into death and he burst out the other side in life. And if we follow him to our death, we can follow him through our death into resurrection, into life. And if, if this life is all there is, then, then everything is meaningless. What Ecclesiastes 12 says, if, if death is the end of the, of the line, then we should avoid it and deny it and do everything we can to hold it at bay. Life is pointless. But since Jesus died and rose again, if you know him, you can follow him into death and through death to the other side. And you can say like the Apostle Paul, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Let's pray. Yes. Please. Say something, Barry. Here. I'll uh, be a forum Wednesday, and I never thought I'd live this long. But there's verses that kept me going. In the days of youth, remember now thy creator. In the days of youth, when evil days come not, and the years draw nigh. Mm-hmm. 
And now she says, I had no pleasure in them. My stepmother taught me that one. Wow. My sister, who died at age 13, gave me this verse. I am the Lord your God, who takes you by your right hand. It says, fear not, for I will help you. Isaiah 32, 13. And when I was 70, these words came to me, and they're in my Bible. I can remember how they went. For when I close my eyes in death, his loving face I shall see. To his arms I will embrace the love that God has for me. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Wisdom to pass on. Thank you for sharing that, Barry. Let's pray. Does anybody else have something to share, I should add? Father, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you became human, that you are human still, and that you shared in every pain, uh, including death itself, so that for those of us who know you, when we taste death, um, it is only a taste, and there is life on the other side. Help us to be courageous. Help us to be hopeful. Help us to be, to be brave, to follow you in death, to be realistic and honest, um, that, we would, um, that we would do what Barry has done and plant the truth deep within us so that when we need it most, it would be there. Lord, equip us for this, this task that we, all of us need to do to face death. Help us to do it with your strength and, and in faithfulness to our Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.